goal of this workshop is to help journalists become more confident, knowledgeable, and skillful communicators about climate change. We wanted to help them personalize and localize the story of climate change for their readers and viewers so they can understand how it's affecting us here in North Carolina. We also wanted to provide them with some resources, the names of scientists that they could contact throughout the state and where they could find good information and good visuals that they could use in their reporting. Ultimately, the goal is to improve the quality and quantity of coverage of climate change in our state. We're gonna take everybody out in a boat. We're gonna to go to Bear Island, Bogue Inlet, and Jones Island. We're gonna be looking at things like living shorelines, which are alternatives to hard structures like bulkheads. They protect the ecosystem so that fish can live and oysters and other sea creatures can live rather than putting up a hard structure, which is not good for nature and ultimately is not very good for protecting property either. There's a huge benefit to getting reporters out in the field and letting them see what's really going on, letting them see impacts and how they're affecting people. You know, for, for reporters to just put them in a classroom and give them lectures about climate change, it's not really that effective. But when you get them together with scientists and let them learn from the scientists, but then also go out in the field with scientists and see things for themselves and ask questions and also to practice what they're learning. One of the things we did here that's so effective is we gave the journalists a chance to practice what they've learned and the resources that we've given them by creating their own stories and then getting feedback from us and from each other about how to improve those stories. People really learn by doing, and this was a very hands-on, practical kind of experience. So here at Hammocks Beach State Park, we have done several approaches to reduce shoreline erosion that's caused by wave energies from boat wakes, but also from winds and our frequent and intense uh, tropical storms and hurricanes that have increased in recent years. And what we have done is replaced a bulkhead with a living shoreline. It's a more natural approach to reducing shoreline erosion. It's also less expensive. Bulkheads require a lot of maintenance and repair, whereas living shorelines, once they are built, they can be pretty much left alone. The one that's here has been in place since 2002 and you can see that it has been doing great. It has slowed down wave energy. It's just a different approach that helps to protect the habitat while at the same time slowing down erosion. is a 20-acre island. About 70% of it is owned by Hammocks Beach State Park and unfortunately the island is eroding due to the increased intensity of tropical storms and hurricanes that have affected us in recent years and continue to do so in the future. One of the things that the park is doing here at Hammocks Beach State Park on Jones Island is incorporating living shorelines to not only help prevent erosion of the island but also to create valuable oyster and salt marsh habitat. We have worked here since 2007 and we have put in over 1,400 linear feet of oyster shell bag sills which work to reduce wave energies and prevent erosion and we've also planted over 90,000 salt marsh plugs which also help to reduce erosion, create habitat and help improve the water quality of the White Oak River. The oyster shell bag seals at Jones Island can be identified by the PVC posts that are along the island. You can see a little bit of them peeking through and those are our oyster shell bag seals. They are basically comprised of recycled oyster shells that are bagged by our volunteers and then brought over to the island and put into the water. And the oyster bags and the oyster shells serve as a substrate or surface for oyster larvae that are swimming in these waters to attach to. And eventually these oyster seals will be oyster reefs that will help to reduce erosion, help with improving water quality as each oyster shell can filter lots of gallons of water per day and also provide valuable habitat for fish and crabs. The first point that I always make, um, you know, is that you know, the science is not controversial. It's not new. Um, what we're talking about is two century old science. Joseph Fourier, same scientist who gave us the law of heat conduction back in the early 1800s understood uh, that certain gases in our atmosphere, greenhouse gases, have this warming influence on the surface of the planet. And over the last two centuries, we've been uh, essentially just refining our understanding. So the critics will also sometimes tell you global warming, climate change is based on these untrustworthy climate models. And that's doubly wrong because as we'll see shortly enough, there are reasons to trust these models and what they have to say. Uh, but the evidence for climate change isn't based on climate models. The evidence for human-caused climate change is based on two-century-old physics and chemistry 
irrefutable measurements that were changing the composition of these warming greenhouse gases and equally irrefutable measurements that the Earth is indeed warming as we expect it to. Now these climate models are useful for posing and testing hypotheses. After all, we are engaged in an uncontrolled experiment with the one planet we have, um, uncontrolled and unprecedented. And if we want to pose what if questions and try to answer them, um, like what would we expect if human beings hadn't been pumping greenhouses into the at greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, um, then we have to somehow take our conceptual understanding of the way the system works, the underlying physics of the atmosphere and the oceans and the ice sheets and how they all interact, and formalize that understanding in the form of a model. And we can use that model to test some of these hypotheses. This is a climate model where CO2 concentrations are increasing. And by the end of two centuries, in this simulation, we'll have seen more than four degrees Celsius of warming. And you can see the global temperature here as time goes on, but that's what the actual patterns of surface temperature around the globe look like, where warm and cold colors represent uh, where we are relative to a late 20th century baseline. And you can see even well into the future, you still get some cold winters in North America. So a cold winter in North America doesn't disprove climate change. We'll see more warming over land than over oceans. So when we cite those global temperature numbers, they're actually uh, an underestimate because the warming we'll actually feel is going to, where we live on land regions is going to be more and the warming in the Arctic even more because of the amplifying factors uh, of uh, melting ice and increased absorption of heat by the uh, Arctic Ocean. And you can see as we get into 2100 the warming continues to become more and more pervasive. What I tend to do these days is I show images of how climate change is impacting us. Now I used to end the sequence with the, the polar bear on the ice flow. Uh, by making the polar bear the poster child of climate change, unfortunately, um, I think we've wrongly sometimes conveyed the notion that this is an abstract problem way off in the Arctic, maybe a problem for these exotic beasts that we've maybe seen once or twice in our lifetimes, um, when in fact climate change is impacting us now. Now I have colleagues who say it's not about the polar bear, it's about us. I disagree with that. It's about the polar bear and it's about us. It's about both. We have to incentivize you know, a, trans a fundamental transition away from our reliance on the fossil fuels that are contributing to this problem. The point I'll end on is that there is a very worthy debate to be had uh, about the, the policy prescriptions for dealing with this problem. I uh, wrote an op-ed last year explaining how Ronald Reagan would have supported market mechanisms, pricing carbon, which is a market mechanism for dealing with this problem. Let's debate that. Let's talk about uh, you know, the solutions. Let's have that worthy political debate to be had about the policy prescriptions, but we've got to stop this silly and unworthy debate about whether the problem exists. Um, there is no longer any room for a good faith debate about whether we have a problem. There's a lot of room for a, po a policy debate about how to deal with it. I'll leave it on that note. Thanks. had a general overview of climate change, we'll deal with attribution of extreme events. So I'll first generally talk about detection and attribution. Among climatologists, we often throw in detection and attribution as if it's one word and one thing, but they're really two separate things. The first is detection. Can we detect a statistically significant change in the climate? And then the second part is attributing it. And when we talk about attribution, we're usually talking about it to anthropogenic climate change, human-induced causes. Can we attribute it to climate change? That, the analysis almost always involves comparisons to models. Not always, but almost always. And you know, so do the models with increases in greenhouse gases show this change, while the models with no increases in gases do not? You can't attribute any single event to global warming. The science has essentially moved on. As we wrote in our paper <laughs> once, it is now widely accepted that attribution statements about individual events are possible provided proper account is taken of the probabilistic nature of attribution. A little nerdy for it's communication. So to give an example, we'll use a baseball analogy. Your favorite baseball player is just on a really hot streak. He's stronger and he's hitting more home runs and he's really doing great. And you watch him play and he hits a ball out to center field and you manage to catch it and you catch the ball. 
And then the next year they start adding strict steroid testing. And he stops being quite so bulky and he's hitting 20% less, less home runs. And you realize you caught this ball when he was on steroids. Was this home run due to steroids or was it due to his natural ability? And we can't attribute it by, as a binary chance, choice, but we can say then that you had a 20% chance that this home run was due to steroids. And that's the kind of probabilistic nature that we're talking about in terms of, of climate change of individual events. We're not saying it was completely due to it in most cases, but we're saying, you know, what is the fraction of applied risk we're dealing with? I just want to share with you my, my story about how I have evolved on the climate issue and where it's led me, which is actually to a place that I didn't think it was going to lead me. But for most of my adult life, I was a hardcore skeptic and uh, felt like uh, it was my duty to counteract the liberal media uh, who was only uh, uh, giving one side of the story. and. Um, I woke up one morning several years ago, which in of itself was a good thing, <laughs> and uh, there was this burning question uh, that somebody put there, I don't know, and the question was, Greg, are you doing the same thing the people you're criticizing are doing in the sense that you're only looking for information to support what you already think? And unfortunately, I had to answer, maybe not intentionally, but that's what I was doing. And so I didn't change my mind that day, but I simply committed myself to being more open-minded and objective about the issue. I think where, where our society you know, fails a little bit, and, and when I go out and give talks to groups now, I, I bring this up all the time, I said, think back to when you learned about the scientific method. And there are three basic parts to it. You have a hypothesis, which everybody's entitled to. They're legal, they're free. It's great. Uh, but then you're supposed to test it. And the way you test it, one of the best ways to test it is to try to prove yourself wrong. And only upon failing to do that do you accept it as your conclusion. And I think we live in a world right now where everybody wants to jump from the hypothesis to the conclusion because it's too damn much trouble to do the work to test it. <laughs> to people of faith, I say, science is a gift, embrace it. And to people of science, I say, you don't have to believe in God, but if you respected those who do, they might be more open to hearing what you have to say. But though, I think those two things have to happen in order for there to be a dialogue. And then politically speaking, Bob Inglis, and I don't know how many of you know this story, he's a, uh, former congressman from South Carolina, you mentioned this in your talk, and uh, six-term congressman, won by landslides every year. Only thing he knew about climate change until 2008 was that if Al Gore is for it, I'm against it. And he got an invitation to go to Antarctica. He talked to scientists down there. So he came back with a changed mind, and he made that public, and the Tea Party went after him, and he dropped from 85% of the vote to 29% of the vote in the primary. Didn't even get to the general election. And so he has started a nonprofit group called Republic N, uh, spelling Republican with E-N at the end instead of A-N, E-N for energy. And, uh, and his argument is, I'm still a conservative. Conservatives have the answer to this. We're all about free market, free enterprise. If we take the lead in developing the new technologies for alternative or new renewable energy, there are entrepreneurial opportunities, which then creates jobs, which then stimulates the economy. He said, we have the answer. It's just that we're not looking at it the right way. And, and, I, and I'm sitting there thinking, now there's somebody who's thinking outside the box. So, when I, again, and I'll close by saying this, when I go out and talk to groups, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to launch head into this whole critical thinking thing that, you know, it's okay that you have a strong belief about something, but, but test it. And if it turns out to be wrong, don't be ashamed. Be thankful. You learned something. You grew as an individual. That's what society is all about.
It's not a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs>
We're always happy to talk about the subject, but we can provide expert sound bites if you're working on a particular story. And we can also do the background research. And we do host monthly or sometimes once every couple of months online webinars. And for those couple of you who are interested in keeping your CBMs, they count toward recertification. This little thumbnail, the featured graphics that we have, and it's a TV ready graphic. It comes in several different formats. The individual can just click on whatever format they want and they can get it. And it works just as well for, for text journalists as well, not just broadcast. So what we try to do is make these things as simple as possible. Just drag and drop. You save it to your, to your weather computer, you insert it, bang, off you go. The archive goes back to 2012, but it's really strongest over the last 24 months. Some of our offerings here do repeat with seasons, but sometimes they're, they're different. things we did in the workshop was to have the reporters craft stories, work together to craft stories from the information that they've been learning about, and to deliver those stories to the group and then get feedback. So they talked about things like water infrastructure and living shorelines and how areas around the coastline could deal with the issue of sea level rise and how they would be able to respond to it how they would be able to possibly move to advancement zones away from the coast. So it was really a great experience, I think, for these reporters to work together and craft stories based on the resources that they learned here at the workshop and the science that they learned from the scientists that were here, and also what they learned out in the field going to these islands and inlets. So I was going to let us start off, um, just a chance to share with each other, maybe start off with something that you know, we, we've walking away from today that we didn't know coming in. I mean, I'm kind of walking away with this thinking, you know, when I write stories, um, really coming at it from it, uh, the human perspective of it all and telling it, you know, kind of what we've focused on and leading in with our stories is letting the people tell it. And it may not be, this is the science of it, but you know, I grew up here, I've lived here for 75 years and these are the changes that I've seen. And I think that's a really good segue to go into the science of it and you know, why these changes are happening. And you've got this individual who may not talk about retreating, may not talk about any of the science of it, but has, you know, this visual that they can paint for you of you know, I think somebody was talking about, you know, they said they could play in the forest and now it's all swamp or marsh or, you know, and I think those are great human visual aids that as a reporter we can write about and I, to really hit that message home. to tell you just a little bit about there's lots more than 10 reasons for hope. Energy efficiency works and we understand how it works so let me walk you through this graphic. The blue line is California's per capita electricity use and the red line is the rest of the United States per capita electricity use and so we see that Californians get the same electricity services as the rest of the country but they do it with 40 percent less electricity. They've done it with simple, not very sexy things like appliance efficiency standards. Energy efficiency works. It not only saves electricity and saves carbon emissions, but it saves you money. It's actually good for your bottom line. So energy efficiency is just a beautiful thing and there's no reason not to exploit it. The cost of solar, we've already talked about this. It fell so fast and so precipitously, we couldn't have even imagined it happening as fast as it has. And it's made a huge difference. It's on track to be as cheap or cheaper than the average electricity in 47 states within the next couple of years. Wind is growing really fast around the world and in the U.S. This is the U.S. number. This is global wind capacity. Businesses are engaging. You know, people have long thought, oh, this is the bailiwick of environmentalists. But look at all these businesses. Homeowners were asked that what was your primary motivation for putting those solar panels on your house? And 82% said to save money. So this is great. We're finally getting away from that idea that this is expensive and it's a hobby thing for people who are rich and just want to do something good for the environment. People are doing it because it's saving them money. 
and there are companies that will come and put the solar collectors on your roof and you don't actually have to pay for that. They'll lease them to you and you, your bill goes down every month and you know, they're basically taking the savings. So there are ways to do this without even any upfront cost to you. And really I think the biggest piece of good news is this. The choice is ours. The future is in our hands. We have the power to choose a future with a little more climate change or a lot more climate change. So that's up to us. And that's the good news. <laughs>People need to learn more about climate change so they understand how it affects them and what we can do about it. They need to be empowered to understand that there is a lot we can do about it, both to adapt to the impacts that are, we can avoid and to reduce future impacts by reducing future climate change by reducing our emissions. Now, most people get their information through the media. So if we can work with journalists in this state and in other states around the country, we can really help to raise the quality of that reporting and help people see what climate change is about for them. I think we can really make a difference in terms of the societal understanding of the issue. And you know, really what we want to do is apply the best science to our decision making. It's not an advocating for any particular policy or particular way of handling it, it's just saying, Let's look at the best science, and then let's make decisions based on that science. So changing the societal conversation on climate change really involves increasing the quality and quantity of reporting on it. And a workshop like this that brings reporters together with scientists on the ground to learn about climate change, both the science and how it's affecting us and what we can do about it, is really a great step in that direction.